Well, hooty who? Who knew there were so many hoodoos in the vicinity of our great town, Dilly Doo? Mr. Mayor. Ah, deputy. What is all the hullabaloo? Well, a couple things. Firstly, we are running low on snake oil. The snake oil pipeline was supposed to be installed by that suave salesman Lou. He said he would be back in a few, but by my calendar, he is overdue. More specifically, by six months, and we paid in advance. Do you get the feeling we were conned? Uh, what were the other bits of news? Oh, yeah. The cult is worshipping again in the gulch. Oh, poo. And a scary-looking feller walked into town. Does this fellow have a crew? No, he rode into town solo. He had a dark-colored hat. Looks pretty cool. Deputy, deputy, deputy do. What did I tell you? Stranger with a black brim, stay away from, from him. him. Stranger, Stranger with, with a white, white hat, give that, that man, man a gat. See, you knew. But what if the stranger is a child? Hmm. Well, I reckon that would fall under taboo, so... That's an exception to the rule. Listen, these things tend to resolve themselves, so do not pursue. Now, go on and shoo. I'm busy admiring the hoodoos. I've been setting up quite a few desert-themed tables lately. Most of these games have been focused on dilapidated industrial sites. The rusted machinery and weathered fencing looks great, but I want to put together some more natural desert scenes. To do this, I need to populate the table space with a different set of terrain features. A desert is not the most welcoming environment when it comes to foliage, so I am limited to dry shrubs and grasses. I need something else, though. I need something bigger that can block line of sight. Boulders and rock formations are just what I need. It turns out there are quite a few good videos out on YouTube about how to build desert rock terrain. Crafting these looks fairly simple, so I'm going to give it a shot. In this video, I will craft a bunch of desert rock formation terrain for miniature gaming. Let's jump right into it. These pieces of terrain will be made out of XPS foam. If you craft miniature terrain, then you have probably used or at least know of this material. It has a very fine texture that allows it to be carved and chipped to quickly resemble rough, jagged stone. I plan on shaping most of the rock formations into towering spires and hoodoos. I cut a bunch of rectangular blocks of foam with my box cutter and started stacking them to get a rough idea of what shapes I will be building. I was a little curious and decided to try gluing these stacks together with PVA. Long story short, it did not work. The outer edge of the glue dried and the foam did its job and insulated the glue in the center. I ended up disassembling these pieces. This ordeal was actually a good thing because it bought me time to realize that it is easier to carve these pieces before they are glued into one solid pillar. The desert rocks I am trying to simulate are characterized by their stratified surfaces. Variation in sediment deposition over time leads to the formation of distinct layers in the rock strata that each have slightly different composition and properties. Some layers may be weak and brittle, while others can be hard. As the stone erodes, these differences in structure become apparent in the shape of the rock. I need to carve the foam to resemble such a striated shape. It is surprisingly easy to do. Just score the sides with parallel cuts and start carving and chipping away the edges. These parallel slices help by both visually distinguishing and also physically separating the layers. The cuts allow for pieces of layer to be broken off without affecting the adjacent layers. For some of the edges, I started with a deep slice to get a rough slant and then went back over the side, chipping the surface into its final shape. For others, I went straight to hacking out bits one layer at a time. I tried to chip the foam such that each layer would not exactly match up to its neighbors. This should help accentuate the strata of the rocks. 
Nearly all of the rock formations will be made of multiple blocks of foam. I generally started by carving the top piece and then worked my way down through the layers. I would mark the outline of the previous piece before carving the next so that their shapes would roughly blend together when finally stacked. I carved these pieces to form a big chunky tower. I like the size, but it looks a little too rectangular. Cutting a slant into one of the corners should make this look more natural. I made the most drastic cuts on the upper pieces, but decided to let the slant fade out into the more rectangular shape at the lower levels. There, that looks better. Not all of these pieces are going to be towering spires. This chunk of foam will be a large flat stone resting over two pillars to form an arch. I marked the spots where this top piece will be glued to the pillars and then made sure to carve every other surface of the block to remove any unnaturally flat surfaces. I made sure to carve the top faces of every piece that would end up as the head of a rock formation as well. This project produced quite a lot of scrap XPS chips. This kind of looks like a breakfast cereal. Say goodbye to everyday breakfast with XPS foam chips. Wow. It's colorful. It tastes like crude oil. It's squishy. I feel sick. It's not for human consumption. There's a piece in my lung. XPS foam chips. Please, no more lawsuits. My original plan was to glue these segments into large, solid monoliths, but I soon realized that these pieces would be more useful as separate chunks that could be combined to create larger formations. This presented a problem though. The lower chunks would have very flat surfaces. Carving them would make their tops look natural, but too uneven for stacking. Leaving them as is would look artificial. I found a compromise. I've seen other train crafters press their foam with actual rocks to create a bumpy stone surface. This should give these platforms a more interesting shape. While I was at it, I decided to press the sides of all the pieces as well. It is time to glue the pieces together. PVA failed me, so I am back to using the good old hot glue gun. Not all terrain crafters prefer hot glue, as it can melt the foam. Personally, I kinda like that it melts the foam. Hot glue is thick, and in my mind this deformation helps pull the two pieces together for a tighter fit. Most of the formations are turning out to be towering spires that taper at the top. I'm crafting a few of them to thin at the middle and then widen to a big flat capstone like this one. I am crafting these rock formations without bases, but I need to make an exception for the arch. The columns look too fragile. I can picture this structure being surrounded by sand with gritty piles sloping up around the pillars. The base needs some decoration, so I will try to make this idea a reality. This wood filler should work for simulating sand. I can work it into sloping shapes and it dries with a very fine texture. The stuff can be loosened for cleanup using water. I wet down the base before applying it to hopefully help bond the putty to the porous paper. A little later, I wet my hands and smoothed over the surface of the putty. I tried my best to add a few subtle wind lines to the surface. As a final touch, I added a bunch of chipped pebbles to the base to resemble the tips of rocks that broke off and are in the process of being swallowed up by the sand. Now it is time to paint.
To prime these, I am using a 50-50 mixture of PVA glue and black acrylic paint. It is a substance known to the scientific community as goop slop and, on occasion, glop. This mixture is supposed to be a little more durable than just straight up paint. This will not necessarily save the paint job, but it is supposed to help protect the foam beneath. This step is tedious. The rough foam surface is dotted with nooks and crannies where it looks like it has been painted, but by the time it has dried, these little pink spots appear. I just have to be persistent and go over the pieces again to clean up the spots I missed. After that dried, I mixed up an orange-brown paint and gave each piece a solid coat. This step is also fairly tedious, but at least this time I'm covering up black instead of pink foam. The next step is a quick brushing of the same color, except with more orange paint added to brighten it up. The motions I'm making are similar to dry brushing, except the brush has more paint. By stroking up and down, I am taking advantage of the shape of the model. The sharp edges of the strata run perpendicular to the brush strokes and thus catch the paint, getting highlighted, while the recesses are, for the most part, left a darker shade. It was about this time that I returned to the stone arch to give the sandy ground a base coat. I decided to go for a slightly warmer color than usual to tie in with the color of the rocks. These pieces need a wash to further darken the recesses. I'm using a brown wash. It's actually the same wash I used on the SUV model in my video about crafting cars for Gaslands. I made some crazy modifications to those models. Anyway. This wash has a kind of motor oil brown color. It was a good choice and it seemed to amplify the orange paint. The effects of pressing the texture into the foam are starting to show up on the paint job. The washes are collecting in the little divots. For the final step, these models are going to get a sandy brown dry brushing. I brightened up the peach color that I used on the sand. I'm using a big soft makeup brush to apply the highlight. This is a little tip I picked up from watching Geek Gaming Scenics. These makeup brushes are great for dry brushing terrain. I was going to call it here, but the rocks look a tad bit dark. If you search up pictures of desert rocks, most of them are fairly bright. I decided to give all the rocks a second layer of highlights. I held back on painting a few of these pieces to show you side by side how the different steps of painting these changed the models. As you can see, the first two steps looked pretty flat. The colors get a massive boost to depth with the wash, and the highlights from the dry brushing steer the color toward a more realistic, brighter desert tone, while giving the surface a dry, gritty appearance. Personally, I find that the paint job only starts looking good when I reach the washes and highlights. Try not to get discouraged when painting. Sometimes you have to see it through to the end to know if you are doing it right. I put a quick wash over the base of the arch and then gave both the sand and the rock a dry brushing. I thought I was done with this piece, but a few days later, I dry brushed the sand some more to make it brighter. It still did not look right, so I gave it a more yellow, heavy dry brushing. And with that, the last of these terrain pieces is complete. It was a lot of work, but these will look great for a desert wasteland table. The smaller rocks and spires will be nice for breaking up flat sections of the board. I did not mention this earlier, but these two short rocks were originally going to be glued together to form a single boulder. I am glad that I decided to separate them because now I have more variety on the smaller end of the boulders. 
I also like the rock formations with the wide pieces on top. This big one here is my favorite. I think I got the shape of the capstone just right. The arch also came out good. The base was a great excuse to try modeling piled sand using wood filler. I think the shape is right. The color went through many changes, but the end result looks decent. I would like to make a thicker, bulkier version of this down the road. As for the other rock formations, I am glad that I decided to glue them into separate segments. This adds to the usability of these pieces. If I want to put walkways or structures on top of the rocks, then I can make use of the flat surfaces of the lower segments. One idea I already have is to use these pieces to represent cave walls. I can flip the lower sections of these towers upside down so that they widen upwards as if the walls are curving toward a ceiling. These chunks have become modular and that opens up possibilities for them to be combined with other terrain pieces. I was not exactly sure what I would end up with when I started painting these. I still think these terrain pieces are a bit dark for desert rocks, but if I were to go lighter, then I think the rocks would have to be more of a sandy beige. If I were to aim for a color that was any darker, it would have to either go toward a dark gray rock or an iron-rich soil red. The modeling was easy, a little messy, but slicing and chipping the foam worked like a charm. One great thing about this project is that the striated texture of the rock layers means that you do not have to hide the seams between the blocks of foam. They just blend in with the sedimentary stone aesthetic. I do need to make some more big rock scatter terrain. I would like to have a set of generic big gray rock formations, but that is for another time. For now, I am happy with these pieces and I look forward to navigating models around them on the tabletop. If you enjoyed the video, then leave a like. If you did not, then tell me why. If you want to see more content, then heed the ancient writings left upon the towers of the Mesa and press that subscribe button. Thank you for watching and until next time, keep making and keep playing. Have a good one. What a strange breakfast cereal. Ooh, it looks like there's a prize at the bottom.